Hi everyone, welcome to Manor from Devon Cooking School and to this wood-fired workshop. In this workshop we're going to be talking about using the oven as a slow cooker using the retained heat of the oven after we've been doing some cooking. This is specifically aimed at refractory ovens really, so like my Bushman Santorini here, a full refractory oven with a masonry dome and a masonry floor, lots of insulation around the outside, built to retain lots of heat. So that the energy we put into it, we then use it all up in cooking over a longer period of time. So we're going to be talking about using the oven as a battery, if you like. And as the oven falls in temperature, I can do dishes which take a long time at a low temperature. And we're going to be cooking a variety of dishes today. The dishes aren't that important except it's the type of dishes which uh, uh, this kind of oven allows us to cook. So we're going to be cooking um, some ham, a pulled ham. I want this to cook for six, seven hours, even overnight, so that when I uh, come to use it, it will just fall apart, making fantastic sandwiches, fantastic pizza toppings, lovely and pea and ham soup, all sorts of applications. We're going to be cooking some stock. So I've had some, uh, a chicken carcass, I've put that in a pot here. We go, and I'm going to be cooking a pot of barbecue beans. Great to go with my ham. Uh, also just delicious on its own and very, very simple to do. <clears throat> Before we put all that together, let's have a look at the oven. So quite often when people get a wood-fired oven like this, they think, oh, I'm going to be able to do some amazing all-night cooking. Uh, It'll be great, are using all the retained heat of the oven. And uh, they finish cooking pizzas and go, well, hey, I'll pop in my dish. And the oven is way too hot. And they come back the next morning to a little dried up pot of beans or a little sort of charred nugget of meat or something like that. And that's terrible. We don't want to do that. Uh, we need to know that the oven has reduced in temperature sufficiently that we can safely put something into the oven and uh, see it cook nice and slowly in the safe zone. So a safe zone is sort of below 200 degrees, above 100 degrees, everything's just quietly, quietly simmering. So uh, what we really need to know is how much heat is stored in our oven, <clears throat> i.e. how much is our battery holding? Now temperature tells us something, but it doesn't tell us the whole story because it doesn't tell us uh, how much energy there is behind that. So um, uh, it is actually very difficult to say how much energy there is stored in an oven, except by um, using your oven a number of times and starting to figure out its profile. How much heat does it hold on to? How quickly does it give that heat back? How long have I got to do some nice, long, slow cooking? And it's different pretty much for every oven because it depends on the mass of the oven. So, you know, how big is it? How thick are the walls? Uh, it also depends on the condition of the oven. So the oven's a little bit damp. Often in our lovely UK climate, ovens are a bit damp, especially if they're out in the garden. Uh, and then they don't hold on to heat quite as well. It also depends, of course, on how much heat we put into it in the first place and uh, what cooking we did thereafter to take it out. You know, if we've been cooking pizzas for four hours, doing lots and lots of pizzas, we are pretty much can guarantee that you've saturated your oven with heat, but you don't necessarily know, know how long that heat will, will last. What we can do is sort of have a look at the temperature of the walls and the temperature of the floor to ascertain what the temperature in the oven will be with the door closed uh, to make sure that we're not putting our food into an oven which is too hot to start with. So I can hold my hand in the oven of course <coughs> and count one, five, comfortably count to five Mississippis before I start to feel heat and that five Mississippi oven is a sort of below 200 degree oven. If I use the um, infrared thermometer, 190 on the floor, 194 on the back wall, 185 over there, 240 over here because 
that's where I had my fire last and that's where I've had the bed of embers which are dying out they're not doing a lot but they've still been putting energy into the wall so that's given me a bit more if I sort of average all of those out I get something about 200 degrees <clears throat> that is the average wall temperature it's not the air temperature the air of course is moving all the time it's a fluid it heats up differently to our solid so it's going to be a little bit below that so 200 degrees average <coughs> I'd say it's not an exact science but I can knock about 10% off that uh, so 180 degrees with the door closed now all of these dishes that we're cooking here 180 degrees is actually a bit too hot uh, we'd like to see it more like 150 degrees however remember that before all of this food starts to cook it's got to come up in temperature and as it comes up in temperature it's sucking energy out of the oven and uh, the temperature of the oven will fall so we should end up with something in the middle uh, so these get hot that gets a little cooler and we should be in that sort of lovely comfortable mid 100s zone which would be great so first of all the ham which we got from our local butcher really beautiful looking piece of ham I've taken the skin off for this because it's going to be a pulled ham dish so uh, the skin I don't care about I haven't retied it because if anything I want the liquid and the steam and the flavor to get right inside uh, so I didn't tie it back up I don't want it to hold its shape when I slice it or anything I want it to fall apart I'm going to add some cider vinegar and this is my tenderizer if you like anything with a little bit of acid in there will help to um, not that much will help to tenderize the meat you also often get a little bit of sugar added to um, uh, to these sorts of dishes but I'm going to add some marmalade pork and marmalade uh, the stuff of my dreams absolutely lovely so I'm going to have a sort of good tablespoon of marmalade also a little pinch of chili flakes and some black pepper and then the lid goes on and we always want to make sure these are nice um, either designed for purpose lids uh, or nice close fitting lids which aren't going to let a lot of steam out and if you're doubtful of your pans then uh, tin foil over the top to make sure that they don't let steam out at this kind of temperature we can use anything in our wood fire oven so we're using a cast iron enameled pot here a stainless steel pot here another um, cast iron enamel anything really because we're cooking at low temperatures where things really shouldn't be in any kind of any kind of danger the stock that I've got usual stuff so I've got chicken celery onion uh, and carrot a few peppercorns a bit of leftover parsley has gone in there as well I've left the skins on the onion that's going to give it a bit of a deeper color uh, and I've got all the bones from a chicken carcass and then my beans I'm using pinto beans so these have been soaked overnight they've been boiled uh, to get rid of any toxins so now I can flavor them in any way, way I like and there are a million bean dishes we're going for a sort of a sort of barbecue bean um, thing here which means we're going to add a little bit of chorizo we're going to add uh, a little bit of sugar I've just got some uh, chopped shallots there and some garlic some tomato leftover tin of tomato and a little bit of tomato puree I've added as well some a uh, little smoked um, chipotle chili flakes for a bit of smokiness from smoked paprika for a little bit of smokiness a little bit of cumin and some mustard then we need some liquid and I'm using a chicken stock and you want to make sure there's plenty of course because those beans are going to suck up lots of um, moisture no need to pre-cook anything except the beans of course um, because all the flavors are going to come together so you'll see as I put this in the oven I've got quite a lot of 
stuff here and quite a weight as well. There's a lot of water in this pan. We've got all of the beans and liquid in this pan and a big old kilo and a half of ham and liquid in this pan and it's a big it's a heavy cast iron pan, not a big pan, but it's a heavy cast iron pan. So I'm not worried that the floor is initially maybe a tiny bit too hot because that will come down and I, nor am I worried that there's not enough energy in this oven. Even though it looks so calm and I can put my hand in there quite comfortably and hold it there. Our battery, it's kind of a slow release battery so it's going to slowly release energy into our food and cook it over a period of hours. I'm going to put the door on. We're just going to leave it there for five or six hours and then have a look and see how everything's doing. It's been three hours since we put those three pots in the oven. I'm going to bring everything out, have a quick look. So the first thing we notice is that things are simmering and bubbling away. Let's just push the chicken down into the stock. This is still shimmering and bubbling. Then in my pot of beans, you can see that it's looking a little dry on top. Absolutely fine underneath, but I'm going to add a little bit more liquid into there. So the stock is certainly not going to hurt to have another few hours in the oven. <clears throat> the ham will be even more falling apart and pullable after another couple of hours. And the beans, but they're not going to hurt to sit in there in what is now a very quiet oven for another couple of hours. So here we are, another two and a half hours has passed. We're five and a half, nearly six hours actually into this cook. And if you're still with us, thank you very much for watching. <coughs> Do give us a like or subscribe to our channel. So if you've got any questions at all, please put them in the comments below and we will respond to you. And we'll put notes and uh, recipes on our blog and put a link to that below. So thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. And let's have a look at how the cooking's gone. First thing to notice that in another two and a half hours, this has only just dropped another 10 degrees. So the first three hours we went down uh, 80 or 90 degrees and then the next two and a half hours just another 10. Because we're now in this lovely state of equilibrium and the oven is just very, fall, very slowly falling in temperature, everything in there is already hot. Those things are just quietly, quietly cooking. This smells pretty amazing. I can't wait to see what's been going on. And you can see that that is still bubbling, barely simmering, but still bubbling away, still cooking, getting darker since last time we looked at it and really squeezing all the flavor out of those bones and bits of carcass. What a beautiful stock in our ham pan. I can see that that has really sort of collapsed almost. So if I go in here with a fork and just pull this apart, you can see how that just now really collapses. But it doesn't look dry at all because we've had the moisture in there all the time. That's going to be really fantastic. In our bean pot, we added a little more liquid. And now we've got this lovely sticky sort of sauce wrapped around our beans. The smell is gorgeous. And we've got three fantastic dishes all cooked in the retained heat of a falling oven, falling gently from sort of about 180 degrees at the start down to maybe just around about 100 degrees at the finish after nearly six hours of cooking.